All right, let's let's dive into this. So we all know that offshore wind plays an incredibly important role on the mitigation side of climate change. But our as we transition um, away from from fossil fuels, but I want the conversation to be today kind of where this incredible mitigation tool we have meets adaptation and, and resilience because the port facilities, which are often being redeveloped from older facilities, they are often in areas that, that tend to be prone to flooding. These are the, the front lines of the climate crisis that will continue to, uh, to, to occur. So we wanna talk about the hazards that the port facilities are gonna face and then how they are preparing to, to facilitate the, the various hazards that are out there. I'm joined today by Mike Taylor, the head of ports for Equinor's US Renewables portfolio. He's leading the, the Brooklyn Marine Terminal project. Also joined by Josh Gillespie, he's an environmental sciences planning New York and New Jersey lead at um, engineering consulting firm HDR. He's also the port liaison for uh, NYSERDA. Uh, we have Shaney Leibowitz, who's the Senior Vice President of Transportation and Planning at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, and has overseen the Brooklyn Navy Yard's master plan and the creation of, of the special district there and, and the, the resilience planning that's, that's going on for the facility. And then finally, Greg Matzat, who is the Vice President and Market Director of Offshore Renewables um, in North America for COE. Um, and he, I think the, the I can go through your background, but the, the really key thing is he was NYSERDA's nice, first offshore wind hire. Um, so it's been in this, this field for, um, for a number of, of years. So let's, let's start with um, just talking about the facilities that you're working on, um, where they are, what are the, the existing conditions, and then kind of how are you thinking about climate resilience in these? And Cheney, why don't we start with you? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so, oh, can, there we go, okay. So here's the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, the, if uh, you're not familiar, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is 300 acres on the Brooklyn waterfront. Um, we have 3.2 miles of, um, of shoreline that we need to protect. We have an active um, ship repair company, um, and, but then we also have, um, we have some wet berths, we have three active dry docks. One of our dry docks is in, inactive, and actually the next slide I'll talk a little bit about um, how it ties into the offshore wind. Um, but uh, the thing about the yard is that it is an active ship repair company, but we, a ship repair facility, but we also have more than 40 buildings that have over um, 500 tenants, 550 tenants, 11,000 jobs. So we have a lot of infrastructure that we need to protect at the yard. Um, we have 6.5 million square feet under roof. Um, and so it is, uh, we are a bit, I would say we, we were a bit behind on the resilience planning. Uh, we had started a few years ago, but not really actively. And so um, we actually, um, you know, have embarked on much more uh, significant resilience thinking. Um, so I'll get into that in a little bit. But this is um, our dry dock four, which is an in inactive dry dock. Um, that actually was part of the New York five, uh, three uh, NYSERDA application. It did not win, obviously, but um, it is a facility that is available for, um, for an O&M facility. We don't have as much space for lay down there, so this would really be an O&M facility. And what's great about it, though, is that it really ties into the green infrastructure and all the other work that we're doing at the yard because there are um, warehouses directly adjacent to these that, um, that could be used for the O&M facility. Um, I think that the developer was actually really interested as well because um, of the advanced manufacturers that we have at the yard, um, like New Lab and other folks, so they could uh, really tie into the innovation at the yard. Um, we, we as well have an employment center, so there's been a lot of talk about equity around resilience, and part of that is really getting people into jobs into the green economy and the green infrastructure so that they really feel a part of, uh, of the community. Um, this really gets to what uh, we've actually just, well, somewhat recently finished a resilient strategy working with Ramble um, and COE on that and WXY as well. Ramble was the lead on this project and it really took um, a very integrated approach to resilience across the yard. As I said, we have, this, um, we have these active dry docks, they're graving docks. 
um, and they're very active. We also have the home port for the NYC ferry. So the strategies around mitigation at the yard are unlike most places on the waterfront because we have to deal with the, we cannot stop the operations of the working waterfront. So we basically created a mitigation wall basically behind, basically all of the infrastructure for the waterfront will be, will be open. We are completing FEMA work um, still remaining from, from the damages from Sandy, um, where we are obviously beefing up the infrastructure there and doing um, some sort of submarine, submarine style doors on our pump wells and things like that, and then raising all the critical infrastructure, the life health safety, um, electrical, mechanical. Um, so that's gonna do, that's gonna hopefully protect the waterfront, and then we create this wall around it, whether they're integrated systems or they're flood walls, um, deployables, there's a whole slew of this. Um, if you go to our website now, we've just um, put that on our website, you can take, take a look at that. Um, and it also, you know, we, we took a, like I said, integrated approach to this where a lot of the infrastructure has to meet our mission of job creation and creating new space, so some of it is to create additional space. Some of it is to provide, um, you know, help our, our safety and maneuvering through the yard. So this shows a detention pond that deals both with um, less with coastal, but more from the rain, rainwater coming from, um, from our Flushing Avenue entrance. Um, unfortunately, we have the best of both worlds. We are on the water and we're also at the base of the hill. So we get it from both ends at the yard. Um, and uh, so, and then, you know, I think the other thing that we did is because we have all these tenants, we also created a tenant toolkit, which really um, is a way that we're gonna give out to all the tenants and it's a way for them to protect their own businesses um, for business continuity and do those things that they can do at the building level um, that could help them with their, with their work. So there's a lot more around this, but don't wanna, I could be here forever. <laughs> Josh, why don't you talk a little bit about kind of the, the big picture for New York State? Where, where, where are the facilities that we're talking about? Sure. Um, from the, you know, the statewide perspective, um, you know, we're starting from the beginning here. So um, we're going to hear from Mike Taylor here, who's at the driver's seat of South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. Um, that's one of the first ones out of the gate. It has a little bit of everything there. So, so they have uh, staging facility they're going to have for Empire Wind 1 and that's going to you know handle all the offshore wind components uh, that's possible at that facility from blades, nacelles, the towers, um, those the components that can fit honestly under the Verrazano Narrows Bridge I mean that's that's our constraint right and that's that's a lot of New York State's uh, driving constraints is is the bridges we have w within the harbor up, up the Hudson River, um, so that's, that's one of our biggest challenges. Um, you'll hear more about South Brooklyn from Mike. Um, then we have uh, Port of Coimans, that's, that's fairly far up the Hudson River, pretty 10 miles south of Albany. That one is involved already with um, Orsted and, and Sunrise Wind and, and the steel advanced foundation components there. Um, and that's, that's been underway for the past year. And you know, they're floating them down the Hudson and, and, and getting ready for construction. Very exciting stuff. They did support um, South Fork Wind, which you'll read about. That, that was just completed. Our, New York's very first offshore wind farm was completed in, in March of this year. So really exciting moment there. It's already powering 70,000 homes out, out east in Long Island. Um, so there's so much more to go. Um, another <clears throat> notable ports we should mention are Port of Albany, and, and that's, that's a quasi-state agency um, with, with uh, um, yeah, the, the uh, Albany Port District up there. Um, they've started construction. They've cleared an, uh, over an 82-acre site that's um, in line to accommodate tower, steel tower, uh, fabrication there. Um, so, so that's in the beginning stages of construction. So that's, that's moving forward. Another one that uh, many are very excited about is Arthur Kill Terminal. And that's the one port that's downstream of every bridge in New York State. So it's, it's 30 acres um, and it's, it's on the south side of Outer Bridge Crossing on that southwest uh, side of Staten Island. Um, and that's finishing up the, um, the EIS and permitting approvals 
They're hoping to have that finished this year and then construction can begin uh, for that. But that's another staging and marshalling um, port um, and that could be for multiple um, you know, offshore wind developers. So that's moving along. The other two notables we should mention are out Long Island, um, Port Jefferson. Um, that's, that's right at the, um, the Jefferson uh, Power Generation Facility. And that's what they call um, you know, a, an O&M type facility, operations and maintenance support facility um, that will uh, be used eventually for sunrise wind and possibly others. Um, and once they get into the maintenance phase. And then the same is true for uh, Port Montauk. So in Montauk Harbor, there's a small site that would just be used for maintenance operations. And that's uh, what they would use, uh, what they call CTVs, crew transfer vessels, these small little uh, vessels that will get out quickly to uh, do maintenance on, on the wind farms. Um, so those, that's a quick overview of the offshore wind farms in New York State. There's a lot more positioning Right now, a lot more ex exciting uh, announcements to come this year. And, and we could have had a, a really similar conversation on the, the New Jersey side of the Hudson too with the New Jersey wind port, the Buckeye facility, there's all, there's, it's not just on the, on the New York side. Greg, we've, we've named a, a couple different types of, of facilities. Can you give kind of an overview of, the, of the, the breadth of facilities that are out there and then what makes a good O&M facility versus a good staging and marshalling facility, for instance. Sure. So, uh, COI is a large engineering consultancy, and we do large infrastructure projects like the Mario and Cuomo Bridge, coastal uh, resiliency projects like the Living Breakwaters around Staten Island, and offshore renewables, uh, both the offshore wind farms themselves and on the port side also. So like we've done the uh, turbine foundation designs for Empire Wind, uh, which also have their own climate adaptation that we take into the design. But with regard to the ports, um, you know, we, uh, we do the market studies. So we did the very first NYSERDA study that identified like South Brooklyn Marine Terminal and, and Coimans, et cetera. And in looking at those studies that you know, that's when you look at what makes a good port. Um, and you've basically got two different types of ports. You've got your marshalling staging ports uh, where you have to bring in all your, uh, your uh, stuff to build the wind farm, the towers, the foundations, the turbines. Um, and then you also have your O&M ports. And they're pretty different requirements, um, most in both size, um, particularly in size, and also in, in location. Um, you know, for instance, an O&M port, uh, you typically would want it to be relatively close to the wind farms that it's going to be servicing, uh, especially if you're using CTVs, uh, like we just mentioned, if you're using a larger vessel, SOVs, um, service operation vessels, you can go bigger, but then also you need more draft and, and different requirements there. Um, an S a CTV is 65 feet and SOV is 250 feet. Um, so that in itself brings different requirements for the um, for the actual staging you know it's it's distance away but it's also how big the facility is what uh, you know are there bridges in the way uh, that limits you um, both in just like if you want to bring your towers the towers are typically transported upright so they're vertical ideally you want to put as many sections together uh, to minimize offshore work, it's a lot easier to put them together on land. So if there's a bridge in a way, that limits how high you can build it up. It also limits what type of vessels you can bring in because these vessels the jack up on legs. The legs are 350 plus feet long. So that uh, kind of requires no bridges. Um, but also, besides that, then it also gets into like vessel traffic you know, what type of requirements are there to get in and out of the port. Um, so, and, uh, and then just sheer size and load bearing capacity, et cetera, which would come into place in the design work. So those are just a few of the initial things we look at. Great. And I, th I think I counted that we've now referenced SBMT or South Brooklyn Marine Terminal seven times. 
Um, Mike, why don't you tell us about it? <laughs> well, why don't we go see it first? Can we pull it up? You want this one? Let's see. All right, so there we go. Oh, go back. There. All right. So this is the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal when it is fully completed and full of offshore wind components. So it's about 70 acres of total space. And on the left side is where the staging area is. So you've got a ring crane on the end that will be used to offload and then load out all of the components as they come in from initially Europe and then hopefully once we get manufacturing facilities in the United States from other locations uh, in the United States. Um, and then they'll go out on feeder barges. Because of that bridge, we're not able to get a, a jack up in there. Um, but the, uh, the feeder barge method is what we're using for our Empire Wind installation and what other potential users of SBMT would, would also need to use due to that height constriction on the bridge. Anyway, you've got the blades, which will be staged on Pier 39, which is the wider pier, the one the crane is on. You've got the nacelles that are below them uh, for reference purposes. And then you've got a mix of nacelles and tower sections to the right of there, and then tower sections all the way down Pier 35. Uh, it's unlikely, especially if we do everything right and efficiently, that it will ever look that full. But that's what it could look like if it was completely full. In the middle, you'll see our operations and maintenance building. So it's a combination of offices and warehouse space. It's got the green roofs, solar, as well as some vegetation. There'll be electric vehicle chargers in the, uh, the parking. Um, and the control room for starting with the Empire One wind farm and then potentially expandable to future wind farms, that'll be located in that building as well. And then to the right in the uh, area with the curve inside the railroad, that is the Empire One substation. It's got some aesthetic fencing uh, screening around it so that it blends in with the existing community. And that is where the export cable that takes power in from the wind farm will come into the shore, it'll get stepped up to uh, grid power, and then it'll go out via an interconnecting cable to Gowana substation, which is our point of interconnection for Empire Wind phase one. So as you might imagine, with the location right in the heart of the Brooklyn waterfront, um, resiliency from climate change is a significant uh, consideration in the design. Uh, tropical, or, tropical storm. Hurricane Sandy, were it to come through here again, uh, would certainly swamp the pier facilities. Um, I wasn't in New York at that time, but it's been you know, said to me that the water was this high above the, uh, the terminal and the piers there uh, when it did come through. So for purposes of the site layout, We've put the nacelle locations at the highest area on the site. It's not that much higher than the lowest area because we are right on the waterfront, but it is as high as they can get. Uh, in the O&M building, one, we have flood walls on the ground floors, and then the control room is located on the second floor. So it is as high as it can get uh, in the O&M building. And then both the O&M building and the substation are designed to FEMA 100 year flood levels with an additional 16 inches of uh, expectation for sea level increase and another two foot of freeboard uh, on top of that. So all in all, number of uh, resiliency aspects considered in the design uh, to allow it to become what we believe will be a very robust offshore wind hub uh, and bring the hub aspect and the center of offshore wind to New York City. So Josh and, and Greg, one of the unique challenges of planning for offshore wind port facilities is that you know, for some of the staging and marshalling facilities, it's gonna be used by one developer and then potentially handed off to another because uh, they built their, their wind farm, they no longer need that, that staging and marshalling space. How, the, how does that kind of factor into thinking about the design life for these facilities um, kind of in the context of increasing sea level rise and, and other threats? Go first. Go. Sure. Um, you know, 
the, the, due to the size of the, what's, what's needed for the offshore wind components, that's, that's usually the driver uh, for these ports. And so it's, it's really difficult to actually share the uh, port at the same time with two different projects. But, you know, with that being said, you know, the, the construction phase of these ports is, is pretty quick. And, and um, so when you look at the, the um, you know, they're actually gonna build, build the offshore wind uh, farm within the first two or three years, and then you've got, um, you know, maybe 30 years of operation once the wind farm's there. So that's the maintenance phase. So initially, you know, they're looking for a, a, a you know, 30 plus year uh, design life. Now, what gets interesting is, you know, the, the owner of the sites um, may not be the developer, right? So the owner, for example, perhaps the city owns the port. They have their vision for the future. And so therein lies the conversation with the developer. What can we do to future-proof that site? And we know you have your immediate need for the first 30 years, but what are, what are some of the other improvements we can do? You know, hardening the bulkhead, um, it, making the um, surfaces more resilient to floods, um, protecting the electrical infrastructure for sea level rise for the future, elevating those, those electrical uh, facility, maybe substations, maybe uh, plug-ins. Um, a, a lot of the, you know, the, those, those, those critical assets of a port that every developer is gonna need. And so a lot of those inter interesting conversations are being had with the owner of the port with, and the developer. So here, you know, the developer has the opportunity. They now have capital flowing in. The investments, can, you know, they, they're, they're mobilized to do this construction. And it's a really nice opportunity to, to, to maximize the life of that port because, you know, the construction is quick. And then you, then you get into an O&M phase. And then what, can, what gets interesting is the future use of that port. It could continue on for offshore wind construction or it can pivot and be part of other industries. And when you look at the ports across New York, so for example, Port of Coyman, some of the most successful ports are um, involved in several industries. And, and that's, that's a really important consideration for the longevity of these ports is uh, to maintain that flexibility. Anyway, that's my initial thoughts. <laughs> so just adding to that, um, I would say like with uh, breaking again the ports into the two types, marshalling and O&M. With an O&M port, you know, there, at least the business case and everything is, is 30 years. It's the length of the wind farm. Uh, so you kind of know the use, um, and that's a little simpler. But at the same time, if you are, you still have to do a balancing act with the design because if you were to design for the sea level rise and for increased storms and for everything, you, you can A, start increasing the, your, if you're designing it for year 30, um, you're uh, increasing the cost, and you're also increasing the functionality because you might end up with a, a pier that's relatively high to the service operation vessel, and that makes actually operating it different. So you kind of have to get into what is the right balance of, of risk of flooding versus usability of the port and then you can do intelligent things like Mike was saying in terms of putting things on second floors and moving stuff. So there's a balance there with the O&M. Uh, the staging ports, um, similar. Uh, the one thing I would say, you know, it's definitely a much more complicated business case um, because things are gonna change with different, uh, different projects being built there. Uh, you have to um, account also for change in technology and sizes of stuff that will be there. Um, and again, though, kind of looking at uh, how it gets used over those things and what's the right balance of project cost versus, um, versus designing the perfect port looking into the future. Um, and you can, you, know, you have to also look at things, you know, like you can put things up higher, but now you have to get it higher and can your cranes you know, it has to be a grade that your cranes can do and your SBMTs can do, et cetera. So there's, 
a balance of, of what. And also then most important is insurance. And then it all mm -hmm. affects into how your insurance plays out too, which mm -hmm. is something that every developer and port owner has to, to work with also and to balance what those insurance costs are versus how you do different designs. So, so as a kind of quick follow up on that, because we, it, it, the thing I was gonna ask next about was the, the risk. So thinking about you know, how you're talking with insurers about that, and you've got nacelles, you've got towers, you've got the blades. How expensive are these things if they get damaged in a flood? How vulnerable to flooding is a, the nacelle versus a blade? Does it set you back significantly in, in construction? Like, talk a little bit about the, the risk that you're taking on. Because the, for, for context, like a container port, and I'm super oversimplifying here, but container port's not responsible for the cargo in the containers if it floods. The developer owns the, the, the components of the, the site, so it's a different risk relationship. Yeah. Hey, that's that's a very good point. So so short answer, all the major components are susceptible to storm damage, right? You've got the nacelles with their electrical uh, interiors. Those aren't designed to be flooded. Uh, same thing with tower sections. Typically, when they're stored on site, they're horizontal like you saw in there. Um, they are somewhat protected from moisture on the outside. Obviously, it rains in you know, the middle of the ocean. Uh, but if you were to have a flood and get water inside the towers, you could have corrosion issues. And depending on how much and what of the internals were in there, you could also have some electrical concerns. The blades are fragile uh, and susceptible to damage from wind or uh, blown debris, right? And to your point, every single one of those components, it's not just how much the component cost, and they are all expensive, but it's with an offshore wind project, unlike containers that are coming in, these are individual components in a lengthy and very complex supply chain that have very long lead times. And so if you start losing them for whatever reason at the staging harbor, you're looking at potentially a year or two to manufacture some of those, maybe, maybe a year, um, get them to the site, and then hopefully get them in the end of your installation chain of the wind farm before you are done and need to demobilize your offshore wind installation vessel. So in terms of that complexity, um, and, and that's something that, yes, you can insure against the physical damage to the components, and to an extent you can insure against loss of revenue from delayed startup potentially, but it's very difficult to fully protect yourself um, economically from the impact of that. And so really what we're doing is trying to build a robust supply chain, and then with our logistical planning, and monitoring the weather patterns to try to minimize the risk that we have any of these components or have many of these components in a location that may be susceptible, that may be in the path of a known hurricane and, and so forth. Because if we were to have SBMT looking as full as it was in the rendering and then have another Sandy come through, that would be a very challenging, very lengthy and very expensive um, you know, incident, uh, disaster to, to deal with, regardless of how much could be recovered by insurance. And the other thing to keep in mind, the reason we're doing offshore wind is to generate power. And you can't insure the actual electrons that are coming into the city of New York. They either come or they don't. So. So, Cheney, you operate a large facility. You've got, a, I think it was 550 different tenants. How has, what is, kind of stood out in, to you in working with the offshore wind industry? How are they thinking about resilience or, or port development differently than other types of companies? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, like, well, actually, they're quite similar. Then they're quite similar to a lot of companies, but you know, they really focus, as I mentioned, on the the O and M facility. Um, and what's great at the yard is that, it, like I said, it ties into our green infrastructure. We've had a lot of um, a lot of folks coming our ways to, for those interconnections to the land. There, I guess there are not very many spots, so they come to us, and we have some facilities that um, can actually um, we can deal with some green power generation. Um, so that's, be, that's been interesting, and it sort of opened up the door to the, that kind of thinking and thinking about how we can um, participate in the offshore wind. Um, so, like I said, we don't, we can't, we wish we could build the turbines at the yard, but we just don't have that kind of space. We are working to get up um, a new industrial, new type of vertical manufacturing building that has sort of large spans that perhaps in the future we could do something like that and help the supply chains and, and have them local. Um, but we, we love, the other thing about the offshore wind too is that from our understanding is that for the O&M facility, really that facility is used maybe two or three times in a, in a two week cycle. Um, and so because we already have a ship repair company that is very active, they, there's a lot of um, sort of cross collaboration that can happen in terms of maneuvering and, and utilizing the spaces. And so, you know, having those sort of connections is really, um, you know, important to us. But, um, you know, we, we definitely are big supporters and advocates of, the, of the, the wind farm and we're trying to figure out a way that we can connect. And like I said, I think our warehousing space and our opportunities for the connections is really um, where the value is for us. And also just because we have an available slip, which is not exactly um, always available in, in you know, the heart of New York City. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have that and, and we, we really, we were trying to activate it as a, as a dry dock um, and it just isn't, is, it's too expensive to do that, particularly given the resilience issues there. Um, and so we think it is a great location to help, you know, further support the industry at the yard. And, you know, um, and we have other companies that are working in the, in the field that I think can really dovetail with, uh, with the offshore wind industry. Great, great. And so uh, Waterfront Alliance leads the, the wedge standards, the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines. Um, that's the, the, the standard for resilience, ecology, and access for waterfront sites. A number of the, in fact, the majority of the offshore wind developers in New York and New Jersey have committed that they're going to use the, the wedge standards on various types of, of port facilities. I saw in your, your first slide, Shaney, that you had a, a, a reference to, to building to wedge standards. Way to know your audience. Excellent job. Um, I'm curious, and in, in it's, it's early stage to be um, asking this for, for some of the facilities, but not all. You know, how are you integrating wedge principles of, of resilience, ecology, and access? We've talked about resilience, but less on the ecology and access side. How, how is wedge showing up in the, um, in the industry for you guys? And maybe, Mike, we'll start with you. Sure, yeah. So for uh, SBMT, we're planning to submit it for wedge sometime this summer. And there's four areas that uh, I can talk about that we are planning to incorporate in the design for the wedge criteria. Um, one of them is public waterfront access. So we will plan, once construction's done and the facility is operational, to give some guided tours uh, that will be available in some form or fashion to the public. Uh, and in addition, we're constructing and will operate a learning center uh, across the street in Industry City where you can look out and it has floor to ceiling windows and you can see everything going on at, at SBMT. Um, and then industrial water dependent uses. So this one's fairly straightforward. SBMT will have fibers constructed as part of the upgrades that will do everything for all of the offshore wind activities there, be they staging, unloading, um, as well as uh, burrs for the SOV and the CTVs to, uh, to dock out. And then we have edge composition. So to the extent that we were able to leave existing edges as is without interfering or, um, yeah, without interfering with operations, we, we've done that, incorporated that into the design. Um, and then finally, native habitat complexity and biodiversity. So the O&M building will be pursuing lead uh, building design certification, and it'll have that green roof, which will use uh, local flora and fauna um, in line with the historic shoreline ecosystems of the neighboring Gowanus Bay. 
and aligning with the ecological goals of the Gowanus Lowland Master Plan that was adopted by New York City. So all those aspects together, and hopefully when you know we submit it, everything is good. Well, we're, we're really excited at Waterfront Alliance that this site is pursuing wedge verification um, and has the potential to become the first offshore wind uh, port facility to, to earn it. There's more in the, in the pipeline, but you guys um, could be the first to earn it. Uh, others that want to um, jump in on the, the wedge question? Yeah, I'll say that um, first I applaud Equinor and, and Mike's team um, for, for raising the bar for the offshore wind ports. Um, I, you know, I've got an interesting look uh, working with NYSERDA and um, seeing, seeing the other ports and their designs come along. And um, South Brooklyn Marine Terminal is set, setting a high bar. I mean, the O&M facility is, is going for lead certification, wedge certification for the port itself. Um, they have the ability to bring in some of some, uh, the uh, landscaping, the native plants. Um, and but public access is a real challenge for a lot of these ports. So some of these credits will, will be more difficult. Um, but a lot of the, a few of the ports, Arthur Kill Terminal and, and um, even Port of Albany, they're looking at uh, visitor centers. Um, they really see that opportunity um, to facilitate that public access that way. I mean, security is really important. However, you know the education. Of, of you know, with institutions nearby and, and, and students and facilitating that that um, you know, next generation that's going to be involved with the offshore wind is really important. So um, Arthur Gill Terminal has this really cool old uh, the coal house on their south side that's they're going to repurpose as a visitor center, and uh, Port of Albany is going to have a another visitor center as well. Um, so. They're doing the best they can, but it's it's uh, it's it's quite a it's quite a challenge for a lot of these industrial ports. I mean, I'll just say that I mean, when we did our resiliency, our resilient strategy, um, you know, like I said, mentioned, we worked with the folks at Ramble who who really applied a lot of the wedge principles to what we're doing. Obviously, it's a it's a plan right now, and we have to go piece by piece and getting it done. So as we go through it, you know, we'll look to wedge and 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 see what we can do. But obviously, we have act we have um, now a place where we can have public access to, to the waterfront. Um, we will when, um, when, when plans allow us to. And um, we obviously have the waterborne uses and all these other things. So there are a lot, there's a huge amount of alignment there. And our challenge right now is really to figure out, just go piece by piece and, and see how we can get each piece funded and, and apply as many principles as possible. Great. And then um, Josh, in the latest RFI from NYSERDA, yeah. Um, yeah. there uh, which is setting up for the next um, state bid for, um, for the developers. There's a series of questions in, in this request for information around climate adaptation and resilience. Curious, kind of, can you speak to what prompted those questions and what NYSERDA is hoping to learn out of this process? Sure, I'll do, I'll do my best. Um, so it all starts with New York State's Climate Act. So in that Climate Act, there's goals for decarbonization and climate adaptation. And what NYSERDA and the states realized is that in these RFPs, um, they really need to embed those requirements, the goals of the act into their solicitations and make it a little more actionable at, at these port facilities, manufacturing facilities, whoever's proposing. And so they're, they're requesting the proposers uh, to demonstrate how they will achieve the, the goals of, of the Climate Act, you know, especially with decarbonization, looking for ways to reduce emissions. Maybe it's uh, electrify the equipment, um, bring in renewable energy, how about recycling and reuse of, of uh, materials, all those good things, even lead practices. And then there's a big hint to apply lead and wedge in your submissions too. And you know, perhaps uh, those bids may score, score, score better. Um, so you know, it's really tying right back to the Climate Act is mm -hmm. what, what a lot of it is. The other part I wanna say is you know, the state 
is really looking, trying to make wise investments, you know, for all of us. And um, so it's, it's offshore wind ports, but also trying to future proof those offshore wind ports and to, all right, it's not just this, uh, this, this current um, project in front of us, but will that port have ability to adjust and be part of an, another offshore wind project? And then maybe beyond that, what, what might be the future uses of that port and, and have some real longevity of these ports? And the city is kind of partnering with the state on that and trying to encourage these ports to, to future-proof. So it goes back to wise investments. Great, great. We've yeah. got a couple minutes left for questions from the audience. Uh, David's got a mic here. It looks like we've got a question over here. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Hannah Van Hemmen. I'm with Orsted. I'm the Ports Permitting Manager. So deeply relevant content. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Um, I actually just wanted to add on, um, which is why I raised my hand so quickly, uh, is part of that future proofing also starting to think about decommissioning of wind farms 30 years from now? Um, because coming from Orsted, who, who's been in the offshore wind game in Europe for so long, that's becoming increasingly relevant. Uh, so I was just wondering if that's part of the planning efforts. That, that would be a wise component to include. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. Showing that, you know the lifespan of that port, and and how you're complying with the Climate Act and the goals of that act um, are, are going to go a long way. But that that's a great point. Yeah, that's, when it comes to the port upgrades at South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, um, I would expect the city would want to take those back when we're finished with them, whenever that ends up being. But for the project components, of course, those are governed by the regulations, BOEM for offshore, um, New York State for the onshore facilities. And yes, to the extent decommissioning is required, um, those are accounted for in our planning even at this early stage. We've got about two minutes left, so maybe one more question. I think you guys answered everything about resilience then. <laughs> so I think we asked the perfect set of questions. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and close out now. The next session is in here at 4 o'clock. Uh, we're going to be hearing from um, Doug Parsons with America Adapts again. He's going to interview Tim O'Brien from Hornblower. Um, Diane Dillon Ridgely from the Center for International Environmental Law. And then I'm going to talk to him about Wedge. Um, I want to thank Equinor for sponsoring and hosting this, this panel and thank the panelists. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, we're back here in about six minutes. <laughs>